You are listening to the second part of the story. You can listen to the first part in the previous video or by following the link in the description under this video. Happy listening! I looked around Molly's small but cozy apartment to get an idea of what was what. The evening here was just what the doctor ordered. This will give me time to fully think about my situation. The first thing I thought was funny was that I just let Molly drive away in my car. I love my Mustang too much to let some girl I barely know borrow it. But I did. Maybe I'm just too trusting. Perhaps this is what brought me to the situation I am in now. I trusted Gloria with my heart and my life, and she betrayed me. I trusted the guys on my team, and they did the same. What confused me the most was that after Gloria, I'm the most angry at Jamal. I really needed to think about this question. Not only did Jamal not have Gloria, or so he claimed, but he was the one who explained to me at least what he knew about the situation. Am I angry at him because he was a messenger, or is there something deeper here? I think in my mind Jamal was almost like a son to me. I spent almost three years building a team around him and trusted him more than anyone in the world except Gloria. I guess I thought we were close enough for him to say something like that to me. That is, I understood what it was to be in love. Damn, I still love Gloria. That's what makes it all so difficult. I would never, ever risk what I had with Glow. So perhaps I am being unfair to Jamal. Jenny was Jean's pride and joy. He even named the girl after himself. Jamal did well at school, was the only guy on the team who didn't waste his college career. In addition to being good at sports, he was also a good student. By almost every measure, he was a fine young man. I just couldn't imagine that Jean wouldn't accept him as a son-in-law after all. But all people are different. I also thought about my refusal to even talk to Gloria. Is this logical? Or was this just another reaction to the pain I was feeling? Nodi go is it again? Was I just a spoiled little boy reacting to things not going his way by refusing to participate? Or is this just the grown-up version of, it's my ball so if I can't play, I'm going home? Only instead of my ball, my wife was here. Does love really require selfishness? Maybe Glow had the right to share herself with anyone. We really do live in a free country. Most state laws pay lip service to monogamy. In most states, you can't be married to more than one person, but that has nothing to do with who you have sex with. If I called the police and told them that my wife had just had sex with a group of college students, they would probably just laugh at me and tell me that it must suck to be me. They would make fun of me behind my back and tell all their friends about me. But on the inside, they would think I was some kind of weakling for not beating the cowboy crap out of her and the guys. After all, that's what they would do, they told themselves. They would beat that bitch until she bled, just like any real man would. On the other hand, if I had done that, if I had done what they thought any man should do, they themselves would have told me, when they came back to arrest me, that what I had done was illegal. My career would be over, and everyone would look down on me for doing what any real man would do. So, what should I do? Call and let her tell me a bunch of lies that I'll never believe? Should I pretend to forgive her and try to get back what we had? What good is it if everything will never, never be the same again? There will never again be that level of naked, boundless trust that we so easily gave each other before. I'll spend the rest of my life checking up on her, and even then, I'll always wonder if she's doing it again. It literally blinded me. People always talk about how they know something is going on with their partner, but I had no idea. And since I didn't know this time, I'll probably never know if she starts again until I catch her. I didn't intend to live this life. I'd rather be alone. There is a huge difference between what is legal and what is right. She always has been and probably always will be. It is perfectly legal for a married woman to go out and have sex with men other than her husband. But is it right? For me, no. Gloria and I loved each other so much that we wanted to spend the rest of our lives together. They made certain promises to each other while doing this. So if she doesn't feel that way anymore, she should have just told me so we could both move on legally and honorably. Her having fun behind my back breaks those promises and, in my opinion, also breaks the marital bond between us. I know some people will say, well, you should still talk to her about it. Why the hell should I do this? 
She didn't talk to me when she decided to start having sex with my team. Let her know about our divorce when the papers are served. At least I won't do it secretly. I'm sure some people will find this too fast. I hear her father telling me to talk to her and give her time to process everything. Maybe in time I'll realize that it's not so bad. I'd like to see how he would handle it if it happened to him. It's always funny when another guy's wife ends up being the other guy's crush. About then I noticed that I was very hungry. I couldn't believe where the time had gone as I sat there, lost in my thoughts. Molly said I could eat whatever I wanted. It's time to find out what I want. Unfortunately, my phone caught me before I got to the refrigerator. Dean, I thought we had everything settled, I said, answering the phone. It's not him, said Harriet. Millie told me that the best way to get you to answer the phone is to use her husband's phone. And I thought that if it worked for her, it would work for me. Listen, Harriet, at least I thought you were a good woman, I said. But I just don't want to talk to you about any of this. Why? she asked. I am part of this too, and besides you, Gloria, and your players, I have the most to lose. You probably don't know this because Millicent didn't get a chance to tell you, but she and her husband seem to have an open marriage. This is partly why it all started. Millie is not going to lose her marriage over this. Her husband will be a little upset because he specifically told her to leave your players alone. Besides your team, they both often sample students. The only rule they have is that there should be no emotional attachment. This has worked well for them for many years. Well, this is great for you guys, I said. This is not very good for me, she interrupted. The dean and I do not have such an agreement. This could end my marriage, and I love my husband. Judging by what I saw yesterday, it's very hard to believe, I grinned. It wasn't love, it was just sex, she hissed. I don't have any emotional connections with this boy. The pleasure I received from him was the only thing that interested me, and I'm sure he has no desire to settle down with a woman who is older than his mother. I am sex for him. In the short term... I'm better to him than some college girl who thinks she's special and wants a guy to fall in love with her. He'll have to spend a lot of money on her and go on dates to places that don't interest him at all just to have sex with her, and when he does, he'll be disappointed because she's not very good in bed. With me, he gets the opportunity to get rid of all this crap. This is like my contribution to his education and experience. Thank you, Professor, I said sarcastically. I think she sensed that I was going to hang up in disgust. Wait, Jim, don't hang up, she said. Do you know what I just had to do? To be tested for diseases? I asked in the same sarcastic tone. No, I had to give a very strong sleeping pill to a woman who had spent the last 24 hours crying her ease out and trying everything she could to just talk to you. She didn't sleep, didn't even eat. She just cries until someone figures out where you might be or how to contact you. But you don't even talk to her long enough for her to apologize, let alone explain, she said. There's nothing I want or need to hear from her, I snapped. My eyes told me everything I needed to know. But Jim, she loves you. It's tearing her apart, she said. Don't you have any feelings? What would it cost you to talk to her? Before all this, you always enjoyed talking to her. Hell, you even called her in the middle of a game while you were sitting on the bench and she was in the stands just ten feet behind you, just to tell her you loved her. Why can't you talk to her now? I'm sure we'll talk in court, I said. Or our lawyers will do it. You can't be serious, she said. You should talk to her before things get that far. You should be more concerned about getting your own house in order, I said. Why? she asked. Are you going to tell my husband? It would hurt him, too, unnecessarily. I thought you were his friend. I'll never do that again. I've learned my lesson. No, I said. I gained life experience. You just saw how everything was collapsing without having experienced it yourself. You learned your lesson without pain. If you want to keep it like this, you need to take care of yourself now and stop worrying about Gloria. What do you mean? She asked. There was fear in her voice. If Gloria decides to fight the divorce and I have to use the video I took at your little party, everyone will go down. The dean will find out about you. To maintain the trust of the board and thus keep his job, 
he will have to get rid of you damn fast, regardless of whether he wants to forgive you or not. Since students are involved, I'm sure the assistant principal and his wife will also be involved in this matter. When the nature of their open marriage is revealed, they will both likely be mentioned. Think about it. While everyone is talking about what kind of wife the deputy director is, some students will say, damn, he's just as bad. I had sex with him during la la la. Very soon, no one will have a job anymore. But, Jim, she doesn't want a divorce, Harriet whined. I do not want either. We have no choice, I said. Your job is to convince her to just let me go or everyone will leave. She will never agree to this. Why can't you just forgive her for once? She asked, because it makes no sense. I said, we had something magical. She ruined everything. It can't be put back together. Even if we did, it wouldn't be the same. It wouldn't be as strong. It won't be as clean. In fact, it would be just a shadow of what we started with. I'm better off just walking away and hoping that someday, if I'm lucky, I can get closer to what we had with someone else. I just don't think I can look at myself in the mirror every morning if I let someone treat me like that, I said. But she doesn't treat you badly, said Harriet. When did she refuse you? She never refused you sex? You had it as often as you wanted. Hell, none of us refused. In fact, that's how I got into it. Martin just didn't want it from me as much as I needed him. In the case of Gloria, everything is much more complicated. Right. She just needed someone who could do it better, I spat. Suppress your ego, she said. For her, it was never about sex. The way she did it, it looked like she was having a really terrible time, I said sarcastically. Jim, if you fucked some woman and she just lay there like a rock and didn't say anything, you'd want to do it again. Or would you just tell all your friends how terrible she is and move on to someone better? First of all, no matter how sexy she is, I would never have sex with a married woman, and especially an unmarried woman whose husband was supposed to be a man I know and respect. But Jim, a lot of it still has to do with you, she said. How can I be to blame for all this crap, I asked. I never cheated on Gloria. I never even thought about it. I loved her too much. I didn't say it was your fault, she said. I just said that I entrust some of it to you. Harriet, you are talking nonsense. Goodbye, I said. Once again, the conversation took much longer than I expected. As I turned off the phone, there was a sound of keys at the door, and Molly came back into the room. Wow, who are you with? She asked. Just someone who thinks I should talk to Gloria, I replied. And you? She asked. I don't see any point in this, I told her. The marriage is over. Is this the first time she cheated on you? She asked. I don't know how many times they've done this, I said. This may have been going on for years, or at least months. Don't you love her? She asked. Much more than I can describe, I answered. That's why a destroyed version of what we had before would just be a waste of my time. I would always resent her for ruining everything, no matter how hard we tried to improve our relationship. We would have been doomed from the start. Instead of sharp and a clean break, we would end up just slowly limping towards the end of the road. Everything will still end in the same place. It will just take longer. There is no point in prolonging the pain. That's why I don't have a boyfriend, she said. I don't want to put up with someone who cheats on me. I won't tolerate this even once. I try to explain to people all the time that if they decide to have sex with me, it's a contract. Once they're in my possession, they're my property, damn it. They no longer have the right to do this to anyone else. Even without a ring? I asked. You're never without a ring, she said. When we make love, it's a ring. Any relationship has the same meaning as a piece of metal. I've never heard such an expression. This girl could do a lot of damage to the jewelry industry. She quickly made a snack for both of us, and we went to bed. Well, we went to bed. I was very afraid of this girl. I tried to sleep facing her and as far away from her as possible, clutching the edge of the bed so as not to fall. I was sure that as I fell asleep, I heard her quiet laughter. When I woke up the next morning, I was still hugging the edge of the bed and still facing her. But for some reason, 
he still looked at her covered ass. She was wearing the smallest thong panties I had ever seen. I was sure that she put them on for my pleasure. She danced to an exercise DVD. It looked like a 20-minute workout from the 80s. This was before this 22-year-old girl was born. I think everything old eventually becomes new. She lunged deeply, and then I realized that I, too, had woken up. As I inhaled sharply, she turned to face me. And here it is, what she's been hinting at since I just woke up from a bender. See anything you like? She asked. Uh, that's all I could squeeze out. I put this on especially for you, she said, smiling. I usually do my little workouts naked, she said, but I didn't want my breasts to jump around here and embarrass you. And I also needed to put something on there, too. I was worried about your reputation. I don't think it's right for a married man to date a naked woman, you know? I couldn't tell if she was teasing me or not. He took a deep breath to calm down. Looking back, it wasn't the smartest move in my life. I caught a healthy whiff of her feminine scent mixed with a slight scent of sweat that only added to the pungent aroma. Can I use your shower? I asked, trying to change the subject. Cold or warm? She asked. I swallowed loudly. I only ask because this is a small apartment with a very small water heater. If you need a warm shower, then maybe we should share. If you need a cold shower, then you're just wasting water because you'll probably need another one when you get back out. She grinned. Molly, I thought you were a good girl, I said. Why are you teasing me? Good girls need sex too, she said. Actually, one of the ways I know I'm a good girl is that I haven't taken him yet. And I'm not teasing you. If you want something, all you have to do is take it. But we both know I'm still a married guy, I whined. Even as I said this, I was beginning to doubt whether it mattered. You are married in name only, she said. You and I are alike, Jim. Once you saw her at the motel, her time was up and you were the winner. I really wish I had the opportunity to do as my grandmother did. Be friendly, but distant with you until six months to a year after the divorce is final. And then arrange it so that they accidentally run into you somewhere. We could have coffee and then you would ask me to go on a date with you. I would say no with my mouth because it's not appropriate for a nice girl to so easily agree to a date with an experienced married man. But even when my mouth would tell you no, my eyes would say, ask me again. So, after refusing you several times to test your persistence and my resistance, I would finally agree to go on a double date with you. That is, if you could arrange a date with one of my unmarried friends or relatives. After a couple of group dates, we would do something innocent and very public together. Then there would be a few casual dates, and finally, a more private dinner at one of our residences. Maybe on our second or third privé dinner, we'd cuddle on the couch for a bit, and you'd ask me to marry you. I would say that I cannot agree to this without consulting my dad. I would arrange for you to meet him, and you would tell him your story and why you want to marry me. He would do everything he could to scare you to death, and then he would finally look at me, see how much I wanted you, and agree. Then my mother and I would organize the whole wedding. It would have taken us six or even nine months to make all the preparations. By then, we would have known each other so long that we would truly be in love. We would become so close that nothing could separate us, not even bad sex. It used to be exactly like this. But Jim... This is the 21st century. If the attraction is strong enough, these days, girls have sex on the first date. My mouth dropped open in shock as she continued. You're a good guy, Jim. I liked you from the first minute I walked into your gym and asked if I could interview some of your brainless assholes. I was wearing Susie's housewife business suit and had pulled my breasts down to make them appear smaller. I wore plain glasses because I was truly interested in completing the assignment for my class and not in becoming a notch on some grasshopper's probe. The only guy who didn't try to hit on me even in my nerdy outfit was you. You did everything you could to try to help me and treated me with respect. That's the sign of a really good guy. Even now that you know what I really look like, I can say that you are a good guy. If you weren't a nice guy, you would have had sex with me when I brought you home. But instead, you're here, even as I escalate the teasing, trying to remain faithful to the woman who cheated on you. Such loyalty is rare. I think I deserve it. And since I'm the same person and we're clearly attracted to each other, 
I should propose and let you know I'm interested before some woman jumps on you when you're worried about yours. Wife. What was even more surprising was that she said all this without taking a breath. But we barely know each other, and I... I began. Thirteen years older than me, she said. Who cares? I'm twenty-two, and a woman. Most women mature faster than men. Your ex may be an exception. Anyway, I only have two or three days tops to make such a lasting impression on you that you'll want to keep coming all the way across the country to visit me. She smiled. Wow, I said. Okay, she smiled. You knew I was smart. I just didn't know that I was so purposeful. But when I see something I want, I just go for it. I frowned as soon as she said that. She looked at me and understood how I felt. Jim, your wife and I are completely different weapons, she said. She's a rocket looking for any man. I don't know her, but I judge from what you told me. Watching you and communicating with you, I see that you gave this woman all the love you had, and this, more than anything else, is what I want. Like her, I am attracted to something so strongly that it can change my programmed course, but I'm a rocket looking for a heart. My targeting system will forever remain with the one man who loves me. The look she gave me made me pulse again and again. Cold, I said. She looked at me strangely. Shower. She started laughing loudly. I liked her laugh. An hour later, I was in the office waiting for the press conference to start. I answered a lot of questions, most of which were the same ones that other reporters from other magazines or newspapers had asked the day before. I think my answers were funnier than Al's. Towards the end of the press conference, I dropped a bombshell that launched newspaper stories around the world. A very nice reporter from the local newspaper raised her hand. Her raised hand caused all the guys around her to lower theirs as they stared at her breasts. Coach, I'm sure you, like the rest of us, predict victory for your team, she began. But what about numbers and statistics? Will Jamal get another double-double today and break the NCAA record for most points in a season? All the male reporters smiled at her. When I started speaking, everyone in the room, including my assistants, looked at me in shock. Nothing is really certain, Carrie, I said, straining to read her name tag. Jamal will not start the game, but how many minutes he actually plays will be decided by playing time. There was pandemonium in the room. All the reporters tried to get closer to me and started bombarding me with questions. Jamal, along with other team members, was involved in violating some of the team's rules of conduct. We are dealing with this within the team, all players may be suspended from the game and have their playing time reduced. We will learn more about this during the game. Thank you. No more questions. I stood up and walked to the door, and the whole crowd of reporters followed me, trying to drag out the interview. Outside the door I saw Gloria standing near the door I had to go through to get out. I started talking to reporters and actually pretended that I was going to answer a couple of questions. A crowd of people pushed Gloria away from the door and beyond as we walked. They followed me all the way to my car, where I got in and disappeared. I planned to talk to Gloria, but only after I was ready. Until I discovered her cheating, we did everything according to her schedule. It's only fair that everything that comes after this be done my way. I drove around the arena and entered the training room on the other side of the building. I drove instead of just walking through the building for two reasons. The first was that I wanted to have my car handy and close to the door, just in case. And the second was for Gloria to see me leave. Then hopefully she won't try to stalk me. When I arrived in the training room, all the players were on their feet and moving. They shot, dribbled, paired up, and worked on defense. The change was amazing compared to the day before. Al approached me as I entered. If I hadn't seen this with my own eyes, I would never have believed that this was possible, he said. Look at these guys. You are an amazing coach. I shrugged. I'd just like to know what the hell is going on so I can help you, he said. In the last two days, you've gone from the happiest guy I know to the most depressed. And now you have that sparkle in your eyes that usually happens when we start the second half of a game trailing by four or five points. I have a feeling that someone has done something to you, and you are about to lose your course. 
L, I said. It's better for you not to know. Then all the consequences will be mine. Who knows? Maybe you'll end up getting my job. And he smiled. I divided all the players into two squads. He gave one squad to Al to train and took the other for himself. Gene was the judge, and my other assistant, Carlos, assisted him. One boy ran into the hall. He came up to me and asked where he was signed up. On my team or on Coach Bundy's team? Al just shrugged his shoulders and I took the guy on my team. He was 1 meter 65 meters tall and weighed about 90 kilograms. He wore huge glasses held on with tape and Converse All-Stars sneakers. Watching him as he walked onto the playing floor, I was tempted to laugh. He kept his arms straight at his sides and jumped so hard that you could feel the floor shaking every time he landed. He didn't look like NBA material, didn't look right for the NCLA tournament. In fact, he probably wouldn't have made the roster of most good high school teams. But he didn't know the meaning of the word quit. He spent the entire game running his flabby ass up and down the court. He was covered in sweat and smelled terrible. His glasses became so foggy that he had to constantly wipe them and pull them down over his nose, but he chased every ball and contested every shot. The shots he took were well chosen, and he had no problem passing the ball if he didn't have a shot. He was my starting point guard. When I announced the players who would start that night, everyone, including my coaches, had shocked faces. Even the players themselves came up to me and asked if I was sure I meant them. I told them all to go back to their hotels and get some sleep. I needed them all back in the arena 45 minutes before the game started. As the players and coaches left the room, I saw Dean Martin walking towards me. A very nice reporter from the local newspaper raised her hand. Her raised hand caused all the guys around her to lower theirs as they stared at her breasts. Coach, I'm sure you, like the rest of us, predict victory for your team, she began. But what about numbers and statistics? Will Jamal get another double-double today and break the NCAA record for most points in a season? All the male reporters smiled at her. When I started speaking, everyone in the room, including my assistants, looked at me in shock. Nothing is really certain, Carrie, I said, straining to read her name tag. Jamal will not start the game, but how many minutes he actually plays will be decided by playing time. There was pandemonium in the room. All the reporters tried to get closer to me and started bombarding me with questions. Jamal, along with other team members, was involved in violating some of the team's rules of conduct. We are dealing with this within the team. All players may be suspended from the game and have their playing time reduced. We will learn more about this during the game. Thank you. No more questions. I stood up and walked to the door and the whole crowd of reporters followed me, trying to drag out the interview. Outside the door I saw Gloria standing near the door I had to go through to get out. I started talking to reporters and actually pretended that I was going to answer a couple of questions. A crowd of people pushed Gloria away from the door and beyond as we walked. They followed me all the way to my car, where I got in and disappeared. I planned to talk to Gloria, but only after I was ready. Until I discovered her cheating, we did everything according to her schedule. It's only fair that everything that comes after this be done my way. I drove around the arena and entered the training room on the other side of the building. I drove instead of just walking through the building for two reasons. The first was that I wanted to have my car handy and close to the door, just in case. And the second was for Gloria to see me leave. Then hopefully she won't try to stalk me. When I arrived in the training room, all the players were on their feet and moving. They shot, dribbled, paired up, and worked on defense. The change was amazing compared to the day before. Al approached me as I entered. If I hadn't seen this with my own eyes, I would never have believed that this was possible, he said. Look at these guys. You are an amazing coach. I shrugged. I'd just like to know what the hell is going on so I can help you, he said. In the last two days, you've gone from the happiest guy I know to the most depressed. And now you have that sparkle in your eyes that usually happens when we start the second half of a game trailing by four or five points. I have a feeling that someone has done something to you, and you are about to lose your course. L, I said. 
it's better for you not to know. Then all the consequences will be mine. Who knows? Maybe you'll end up getting my job. And he smiled. I divided all the players into two squads. He gave one squad to Al to train and took the other for himself. Gene was the judge, and my other assistant, Carlos, assisted him. One boy ran into the hall. He came up to me and asked where he was signed up. On my team or on Coach Bundy's team? Al just shrugged his shoulders and I took the guy on my team. He was 1 meter 65 meters tall and weighed about 90 kilograms. He wore huge glasses held on with tape and Converse All-Stars sneakers. Watching him as he walked onto the playing floor, I was tempted to laugh. He kept his arms straight at his sides and jumped so hard that you could feel the floor shaking every time he landed. He didn't look like NBA material, didn't look right for the NCLA tournament. In fact, he probably wouldn't have made the roster of most good high school teams. But he didn't know the meaning of the word quit. He spent the entire game running his flabby ass up and down the court. He was covered in sweat and smelled terrible. His glasses became so foggy that he had to constantly wipe them and pull them down over his nose, but he chased every ball and contested every shot. The shots he took were well chosen, and he had no problem passing the ball if he didn't have a shot. He was my starting point guard. When I announced the players who would start that night, everyone, including my coaches, had shocked faces. Even the players themselves came up to me and asked if I was sure I meant them. I told them all to go back to their hotels and get some sleep. I needed them all back in the arena 45 minutes before the game started. As the players and coaches left the room, I saw Dean Martin walking towards me. Jim, what the hell is going on? He asked me. I don't know anything about players violating any rules of conduct. Do we even have them? Hell, when you started raiding prisons to find players, I was looking the other way. When you gave a basketball scholarship to a wrestler, I pulled some strings and arranged for his eligibility to compete. Even negotiated for the guy who can't dribble so he wouldn't have to redshirt for a year. Nobody cared because, damn it, I can play better than him. And the Polish guy, he didn't even have a school certificate. We had to start the damn GED program so he could take the classes he was qualified for. I nodded. Perhaps you shouldn't have done that, I said. Maybe it would be better for you and me and everyone else if we just left sleeping dogs lying. Jim, we're friends, he said. At least I'd like to think so. Can you please tell me what the hell is going on? If you found out, you would be forced to do something. Knowing would probably also make your life worse, I said. That way, if you don't like it or can't handle what's going on, you can always just fire me. God, I hope your team isn't so good next year, he said. Well, I mean... I like the amount of money that goes into college, but damn, it's just not worth the pressure and scrutiny. I snuck back into the office and made a few phone calls, including to Molly to ask for a favor. She reminded me of the promise I had made to her and hung up the phone with a laugh, agreeing to do so but telling me that her services might be expensive, although not in monetary terms. I also called my lawyer. Ads were posted and launched. He decided not to fax the papers to me. I agreed with the local bailiff to serve the papers after the game. Isn't it expensive? I asked. Hell no, he said. I made money from this. How? I asked. Think for yourself, Jim, he said. What red-blooded American would refuse a ticket to one of the most anticipated games of the NCAA tournament? These guys offered me money for this. I called Gloria. I was just going to leave a voicemail, but as soon as the phone rang, she picked it up. I told her that after the game was over and I did the interview, we could talk. She reminded me that there would be a trophy presentation and celebration, and I told her I would talk to her before all that. It was more important that we talk. She said she loves me and will always love me, and tonight I will see how much. I snorted, and she said that when I heard what she had to say, everything would become clear. Having finished my business and made all the preparations, I headed back to the training room. On the way there, I ran into Jamal. Coach, can I walk with you? He asked. Why not? I said. Good luck tonight, he said. I'm so nervous that I'm glad I'm not playing. Who said that you don't play? I asked. Come on, coach, he said, smiling. You and I are always honest with each other. At least they were until I ruined everything. 
I should have told you from the beginning. This is why I deserve to be taken away from the game, even the most important game of my life. What you did for me and everything you taught me is worth so much more. More than anything, I'm sorry that I let you down. But I'm going to fix all this. I hope that after this we can remain friends. I'll need you next year. I was shocked. As Jamal left, he looked back at me. God, he said. I'm more nervous now than any game I've ever played in. He smiled and went to where he was going. I didn't know what he had planned, but I couldn't be more proud of this child if it were my own. I went down to the locker room and called all my players who were warming up there from the court. I saw Jamal sitting nervously on the bench. The rest of my starting five were warming up. Most of them were afraid to look in my direction. Jamal nodded at me and continued to cast nervous glances at Jinshu. Suddenly I realized what he was up to and my heart sank. Like I said, I couldn't be more proud of him if he were my own child. Who the hell are these guys? The other judge was kinder. I heard about the rules being broken, he said, and I really respect what you do. It is helpful for children to know that breaking rules has consequences. I nodded. Just before I sat down, Dean Martin leaned over the railing and caught my eye. I know everything, he said angrily. I looked at his wife sitting next to him. She looked scared. She had bruises on her neck, which she tried to hide with a large scarf. She was wearing a lot of makeup, but it couldn't completely hide the dark circles under her eyes. Every time the dean jerked his shoulder, she recoiled from him and said, I'm sorry. I don't care what it costs, said the dean. Burn these bastards. The game began, and silence reigned in the arena. Twenty thousand people sat back, jaws dropped, wondering what the hell was wrong with me. I think they all expected some kind of dramatic statement or one of my well-known tricks. Everyone was waiting for my real team to come out and start playing. But this did not happen. Igor, Tim, Joel, and Billy sat with their hands folded, begging to be let in. They apologized, begged, and I ignored them all. Only Jamal smiled but did not look at me. His gaze was drawn to the beautiful young woman behind the coaching bench, sitting next to Jean's wife. Al also pointed to the bench. He pointed at Gloria. She did her best to look great. I styled my hair and put on a new dress. She looked straight at me, tears streaming down her face, and she screamed, No! Her tears had caused her makeup to run, giving her the appearance of a wild raccoon and the dress she bought was a little tight for her. I smiled as she tried to get my attention. My team gave it their all. They were busier than a bunch of one-legged people at a competition kicking, but it was all in vain. The final score was much closer than I thought. We lost, but only slightly. The final score was 156.9. All nine of our points came from 43 trips to the free throw line. All the other coaches moved away from me as the crowd started throwing things at me during the game. I waved to the crowd, showing off my goofiest smile as they booed me. After the game, I went up and congratulated the opposing coach. He shook my hand firmly and said that I had dignity the size of an elephant. My interview was short and sweet. I'm just saying. It was a tough game with a very close score, and we came out of it defeated but proud. I heard a few chuckles and was sure one of these experienced and professional sports writers farted loudly when I said that. I talked about how the true purpose of sports is to instill morals and good values in our youth, and that, in my opinion, it is more important to teach the consequences of bad behavior than to win. Everyone looked at me like I was an idiot. I was sure I heard someone ask what planet I was from. Then, for the first time in weeks... Everyone just left me alone. They scattered around the floor to interview the winning coach and congratulate him on reaching the final four. I turned around and saw Gloria walking towards me. She swayed as if she had been hit hard. She clutched her chest as if she had heart problems. Jim, honey, you ruined us, she said. It was all in vain. How could you do this? You don't even know what you've done. Before she approached me, I received a surprise. Obviously, basketball fans come in both genders. A pretty young woman who looked like a college student stood between me and Gloria. She looked bored and appeared to be chewing gum. Are you Gloria Turner? 
she asked. Gloria nodded. Are you sure? She asked. Gloria opened her purse and showed the girl her driver's license. I really think Glow thought she had won one of those prizes they give out in the arena. Watching her, I was sure of this. What did I win? Gloria asked. I hope it's money. I really need them now. You've been served, the girl said, loudly clicked her gum and left, and Gloria remained standing with a shocked look. It's all in vain, Gloria muttered. At the other end of the floor, I saw Jamal stand up and slowly walk towards Jean. He touched his shoulder and spoke to him. Jean looked confused, and Jamal pointed to Jennifer who was standing at the podium. The next moment, Jean beat the cowboy crap out of Jamal. Jamal fell down and was knocked out. Jennifer ran downstairs and jumped to the floor, covering Jamal and standing between him and her father. I turned to see a tall, slender woman in an incredible red dress talking to Billy. He got up from the bench and tried to hug her. She continued to pull away from him in a teasing manner. They left the arena together. Some guys are lucky in everything, Al said in my ear. Around this time, a scream was heard in the air. Divorce? There will be no fucking divorce, Gloria shouted. Not after all this. She picked up full speed again and headed towards me. This time there was fire in her eyes. Before she could get there, she was intercepted again. This time two very large men wearing sunglasses entered the building. I think I heard one of them tell her that someone named Otto would like to talk to her. Where is Gloria going? asked Al. I think she's going to Otto, whoever it is, I said. As Al and I watched Gloria being led away from us, he looked at me. She doesn't seem to want to go, he said. I shrugged my shoulders silently. You may not always want this, I said. But when you have to go, you have to go. Why did Jean hit Jamal? asked Al. Before I could respond, another group of reporters headed our way. Coach, what will happen next with your team? asked one of them. Did you really give up the game to prove to the players that you were right? Asked another. I really needed to get away, so I passed on the answer. Guys, when the smoke clears, I might get fired. You better talk to the guy who might be the coach next year. I pointed at Al and deftly stepped aside. Al accepted the spotlight like a zebra, accepts peanut butter. He motioned for all the reporters to come closer. My name is Al Bundy, he began and in high school I played football. What does this have to do with the matter? Asked one of the reporters. Al's response was interrupted by a loud nasal voice. Ill, she screamed, turning her little two-letter name into a hoot that Tarzan couldn't handle. As if sensing Al's moment in the spotlight, his wife Peggy appeared, dragging their two young children in tow. Out of the way, loser, Al's son Bud said pushing me away from the reporters. Looking at Al's wife, Peggy, squeezed into brightly colored spandex pants that she must have time-traveled from the 80s, she had all the charm of a neon sausage. Even with my own failing marriage, I felt sorry for Al. I left the building just in time to see three police officers dragging my center, Billy Bathgate, out of a bar across the street. Billy kicked and screamed at the top of his lungs. You pigs gave me this crap, he shouted and this bitch teased me. I asked the officers what happened, told them I knew him, I was his coach. I was told that he followed a woman into a bar and began to harass her while telling her that he was going to become a famous basketball player. The woman asked him to leave her alone, and the two guys tried to get him to stop harassing her. He started fighting with them, and they turned out to be off-duty police officers. While trying to subdue him, they found several small vials of chemicals. Those were labeled as a banned anabolic steroid. Three ampoules contained too much substance to be used for personal use. The officer looked at me and said sadly, I'm sorry, coach, he said. Your luck just won't get any better. I put money on your team, but it looks like you'll lose your center. By the time he gets out of prison on all these charges, he may be eligible for Social Security. The three things a judge hates most are guys who harass women, guys who hit cops, and guys who try to sell illegal substances. Can I give him a card with the lawyer's name on it? I asked him. He nodded and I showed him the business card. It didn't actually have the lawyer's name on it, 
The front of the card said, Don't use illegal substances, and my real message to him was on the back. After they put him in the squad car and changed the handcuffs to make him more comfortable, I saw Bill looking at me. He looked at me as if he was begging me to try to help him somehow. To ease his pain, I shouted for him to read the card. He had to struggle to bring the card to his eyes, his hands cuffed. But I saw him reading it as the policeman got into the car. He held out both hands as if he didn't understand. Coach, I have never used illegal substances, he shouted. Turn her over, I shouted back. Read the other side. He turned the card over just as the police car pulled away from the curb. I was jogging next to the car. I got really emotional when I saw the shocked look on his face when he read my message. On the back of the card it was written, This is what happens when you have someone else's wife. Enjoy your prison. The look of fury that appeared on his face assured me that he would not be too calm during the registration process. If all goes well, they might even have to stun him in the ass. As I walked back to the parking lot, Molly came up to me. Oh my God, you look beautiful in that dress, I said. Red is actually your color. I look like an approachable woman, she said. But if it turns you on, I'll wear it around the house for you. See you at the hotel in about an hour, I said. Why so late, she asked. The next one isn't Joel, I told her. He's the third. Now, Igor. I drove back to the hotel where the guys were staying. After a loss, Igor had a habit of simply returning to the hotel and falling asleep. A few hours later, he would wake up and simply put the loss behind him as if it were a new day. Then he went for a walk and had fun. Today's defeat ended the season and all the boys were dealing with a double blow. The first blow was how close they were to making the final four. Combine that with a successful season next year and they could all be NBA millionaires. But no one remembers losers, especially the losers who didn't make it all the way. They could still make it to the NBA with a good season the following year, but most of them knew that if they didn't find a way to get along with me, they wouldn't even play for me next year. Plus, they would have to serve a year if they could transfer elsewhere. Transferring was also a problem because most of them knew that most colleges wouldn't take all the risks I took to get them on the floor. When Igor saw me at the hotel, he quickly headed in my direction. Coach! he shouted. Can I talk to... Before he could finish speaking, he was grabbed by four hefty guys in jackets with the inscription INs on the back. Valdemar Shevchuk, we would like to talk with you in the city center, said one of the guys. You took the wrong one, said Igor. Then who are you? asked one of the agents. I am Igor Vastichevsky, said Igor. All four agents looked at each other and gave each other familiar smiles. We're from the Department of Immigration and Naturalization, bastard, one of the men spat. We know who you are. We saw your fucking file. For most of your crimes, you should be roasted. How the hell can you live in harmony with yourself? Unable to bear it any longer, he jumped up and slapped Igor in the face as hard as he could. What have I done? Igor shouted. You're a Pole! but you work as a hitman for the Russian mafia, another agent spat. What the hell are you talking about? Igor shouted. Yes, I'm Polish. I am Polish-American, born in Hamtramck, near Detroit. I am a basketball player, worked in a bakery. I have documents. They turned him around and pulled out his wallet. Well, one more proof, said one of them. He viciously poked Igor in the side with his elbow. Look at this dossier, he hissed he took out a printout of the Interpol dossier. The dossier showed an identikit of Igor. The dossier listed the name of Valdemar Shevchuk. There was a long list of crimes for which he was suspected. Igor Vastichevsky was also on the list of his pseudonyms. Well, Igor Vatusi, the agent hissed. What can you say? Look, you're lucky we're immigration, he said. Our job is not to stalk you. We'll just fly your ass back to Poland on the first available plane. You're flying out tonight. Now get your ass up, or we'll have to get tough. I need a lawyer, Igor shouted. You can't do this to me. I demand that they call me now. You are not an American citizen, one of the agents said. They won't call you murderer. The only thing you'll get is your ass on a plane to Poland. They lifted him to his feet, and Frog marched towards the door. As they passed me, he shouted to me, 
Coach, tell them who I am. Sorry, I said. You've probably confused me with someone who doesn't give a damn. In any case, I am not a coach. I am a priest. My name is Payback. Rev FN Payback. I'm here working on my sermon for this Sunday. Want to listen? It talks about the consequences of carousing with married women. This is a very bad sin. You go straight to Poland and then to hell. Thank you, Father, one of the agents said quickly. He didn't pay any attention to what I said. So, you don't know this guy? He asked. Hell no, I said. None of us really know anyone. Sometimes we feel like we know people. We trust them, and they just stick a knife in our fucking back. In any case, I don't know anyone in Poland. As they dragged Igor away, kicking and screaming, I heard one of the agents say, For a preacher, this guy swears a lot. Just at this time, I received a call on my mobile phone. I looked at the screen. It was the police department. They had two officers in the hotel office, and they asked me to come there immediately. I smiled and went to the office. When I got there, two police officers, a man and a woman, were trying to calm a very hysterical woman. It was Molly, still in her red dress. Coach, thank you for coming, the female officer said. Listen, I sympathize with you from the bottom of my heart. It was a real ass-whipping for your team tonight. They say this is the worst loss in the history of the NCAA tournament. There's talk of naming a trophy after you. I think I heard he would be wearing something that looked like his butt was being hit with a belt. Thank you, I said sarcastically. I just want to check out of here and go home. Unfortunately, I'll be here for another day or so. I have some issues to deal with, and I have to get my team home and get ready for next year. Well, coach, she said, we have a problem. Well, you know those discipline problems you had with your starting five? Now, this could be even worse. Everyone respects what you did. Well, maybe not everyone. Okay, I'm sure someone somewhere respects what you did. I just don't know them. Either way, I think this time it's a little more serious than if your guys had a few beers or had sex with a cheerleader after curfew. Not prohibited substances? I asked. My eyes widened, and I pretended to be shocked. Coach, this poor woman claims that she had an affair with one of your players. What's happened? I asked. Was he too rude to you, or forced you to do something you didn't want to? I'm sorry for you, ma'am, but if you went to his room voluntarily, that implies consent. Molly straightened up and walked towards me. The male cop gulped loudly when he saw how tight her dress was, and there's something about a woman in a red dress that screams accessibility. With the right guy, Molly grinned, there is no such thing as too rough. And with the right guy, I can't think of anything I wouldn't want to do to please him. The problem is that the bastard stole my grandmother's ring. She left it to me when she died, and it's a family heirloom. She took out a photograph of herself, which showed a ring. The photo was amazingly clear. It's as if we took it off a few hours ago specifically to show off the ring. Maybe you accidentally left it in his room and he doesn't even know it's there, I suggested. Both officers looked at me and shook their heads. Coach, while your players are away from home, you and the university are responsible for them. Can you give us permission to search his room since the university is paying for it? If we don't find anything, we won't even need to bother him about it. How do you like this? asked the female officer. It's like he was set up, I said. How does she even know that he has her stupid ring? Molly spoke again. The girl he was with after me is one of my sorority sisters, she croaked. Betsy came and said she saw my ring on his nightstand, but didn't think about it until she saw me again. Okay, let's get this over with, I said angrily. We walked outside the hotel to the bungalows where the team was staying. Each guy had his own small room with a separate entrance. I looked at my list as if I didn't know which one belonged to Joel. The officers used their hotel pass and entered the room. They looked around the room and found nothing. I looked at them smugly. A female officer looked into Joel's suitcase and came out with a huge bag of a controlled substance. I was shocked because Molly and I didn't throw him up when we brought in the ring. It actually belonged to Joel. Coach, 
We'll have to arrest him, the female officer said. You have neither a warrant or probable cause, I said. We came here looking for a ring, and we found his personal collection of oregano. He eats a lot of salads, and these hotels never have the right kind of oregano. A male policeman came out of the bathroom and called us. The medicine cabinet contained several bottles of pills that appeared to be some kind of prescription medication. Next to them lay a ring. They took some photos of the medicine cabinet and returned the ring to Molly. She looked at me and smiled. Who are you, the coach or his lawyer? She grinned triumphantly as she walked away. The policewoman tapped me on the shoulder and told me how sorry she was. You don't know where he is now? She asked. I gave her the number of the criminal investigation agency and told her that since Joel was on the tracker, they would be able to tell her his exact location. I let a few tears fall from my eyes and she patted me on the back. He had to change his life, I sobbed. You can't save them all, coach, she said. When we pick him up, we'll call you. Don't worry, I said. I can't bear to see him in prison again. He's like a son to me. I walked away without raising my head and trying not to laugh. Timmy Turner was completely different. Timmy, other than having sex with my wife, was clean as a glass. And to tell you the truth, I wasn't sure Timmy did it, but he was there. And Jamal led me to believe that, with the exception of him, they all did it at one time or another. Timmy was quite normal, worked a lot on his shots, apart from the other parts of his game. He took today's defeat much worse than the rest of the team, perhaps because he knew that this team was his only chance to become a professional. His best hope was that he could make enough shots to earn the attention of an NBA coach who might want to use him the way I did. If he doesn't make the Final Four this year, much less play next year, he could end up back home at Walmart or a coal mine much sooner than he thought. Timmy was sitting at his computer writing me an apology email when he received the email himself. When he opened the letter, a message flashed on the screen in huge letters. This is what you get when you have sex with a married woman. He couldn't understand it. He also couldn't figure out where the message came from. Before he could do anything, the door shattered into pieces and three guys ran into the room. Tax office, they shouted. Are you Timmy Turner? They asked. He nodded with eyes as big as saucers. Who are Cosmo and Wanda? They asked him. I don't know any Cosmo or Wanda, replied Timmy, who still didn't understand what was going on. If you don't know them, then why did they put money in your bank account? Asked one of the agents. Isn't it extremely weird when someone just puts money into someone else's account? Timmy was taken to the city center and kept there. Eventually, Timmy had to hire a lawyer. He was accused of accepting bribes to influence the outcome of basketball matches. The money that was deposited into his account was traced to Gloria's secret account. But I already knew about this, since I was the one who sent him the money. When it was over, Timmy was banned from playing again. And serious charges were also brought against Gloria. I returned to Molly and found her sitting on the couch, still in her red dress. I hugged her and thanked her. During that hug, she pressed herself against me and teased me to death, but I think we both knew that nothing would ever happen between us. This is not one of those stories where a divorced guy finds a hot young woman to replace his cheating wife. I hugged her one last time and told her that if she needed anything, she shouldn't be shy and call me. For the first time in several days, I returned to the hotel. I still had the electronic key, so I opened the door. Gloria hurriedly collected her things and muttered something to herself. Two guys who looked like FBI agents were sitting at the table. They waved to me as I entered. Gloria turned and looked at me, noticing, for the first time that I was in the room. She came up to me and extended her arms, as if she really wanted to hug me. I shook my head, causing her to stop immediately. We need to talk she said. I nodded. Can we have a minute? She turned to the agents. We'll be outside, they said. Remember that you are doing this voluntarily. Therefore, there is no need to try to escape or do anything secretly. If you don't want to go, just tell us, and we'll go our way. Gloria nodded, and the guy closed the door behind him. Jim, we really need to talk, she said. You already said that, I told her. Well, I know you know what I did, she said. I'm sorry, but it didn't work. I bet way more than I should have and lost. I thought there was no way the team could lose. 
I don't know why you removed the starting five and put these fucking nerds on the floor. Hell, even I can play better than them. They don't know how to throw. They can't pass. They can't even dribble, and I don't think any of them can even spell the word defense, let alone play in it. I was so shocked when I heard that your guys were benched for disciplinary violations. But since the game, I've been hearing rumors about what they did, so I guess you had no choice. I just want you to know how this will turn out for us. I knew, I said, and most of their crimes happened after the game. Then it was stupid of you to bench them, she said, because losing that game destroyed us. It destroyed you, Gloria, I said. I'm fine. In fact, after the divorce, I will just start over and move on with my life. But, she looked shocked. Why, don't you understand, me? I more than understand, Gloria, I said. I planned this. Put them on the bench, knowing that you would bet more money than you have. Some of the rest was also my plan, and some were just luck. Jim, you really don't understand, she said. Do you understand that I am in danger because of what you did? I'll have to go to jail for a while, and even when I get out, we'll have to go into witness protection. She looked at me with a shocked expression. Why did you do that? I thought that you loved me as much as I love you. I snorted loudly. Yes, you really love me, I said. You love me so much that you made love to other guys. She just looked at me strangely. You're joking, right? You did all this because you were jealous that I was with some of your stupid players. Jim, I still love you, but you're a fucking idiot. You do not understand anything. Damn it, she said. That's why I couldn't tell you about it from the very beginning. Men are so stupid. Well, you don't have to worry about stupid old me anymore, I said. Just sign the divorce papers, and you can go wherever you want and be with whoever you want. I can do it right now, she said. No, and you can't stay married to me, I said. What are you going to do, beat me up like Dean Martin beat his wife? She asked. You will never hit me. You love me too much. You're right, I said. But we are getting divorced. No, we're not getting a divorce she said. Don't you understand? This was all for our sake. I looked at her like she was crazy. Jim, I love you with all my heart and soul, she said. I already told you that you are the only man I want to have sex with. You and I are kindred spirits. I want you to be happy, but I need to be happy too. And sex with others makes you happy, I said. Then maybe I need someone else in my life. I keep trying to tell you that it's not about sex, she said. Then what about? I asked. If it's not about sex, then why the hell were you having sex with my players? Seeing you with them, Gloria, broke my heart. She looked at me again and suddenly realized what was happening. Jim, I never meant to hurt you. That's why I tried to make sure you never found out. It was for both of us. Since we have been together, I have been the happiest woman on earth. Every time I look at you, I see so much love coming from you that I just love wrapping myself in that love and your hugs. She actually smiled at me, and there was a radiance about her that I only saw when we were lying in bed together after making love. She came up to me and took my hand, and that's when I realized that I still loved her, despite what she had done. Jim, you always tell me that you're ready to give me whatever I want, and you know what? I believe you. That's why I want to give you something, too. I wanted to give you something for both of us. But the problem is with both of us. My body failed us. That's why I can't get pregnant. I squeezed her tighter. But Jim, as much as you love your job, coaching at a small college didn't work out either. I never wanted to force you to leave here, but you just don't get paid enough for us to find a surrogate or even try any of the IVF methods. So if we were going to have a baby, I had to find us some serious money. I started slowly and over time, I was able to create my own nest. But then I lost and went back to the beginning. Millie and Harriet explained to me that most men perform better with a little stimulation. They were already doing this with a lot of athletes on campus, but if I want it to work, I have to participate too. At first, I thought I couldn't do this. I came up with all the reasons why I shouldn't do this. This is deception. This is wrong. I thought about all this. But then I realized that sometimes you want something so badly 
that you have to go beyond it. Well, you know, like you did when you assembled the team. Even Millie and Harriet's husbands knew that assembling this team put you on edge. Hell, you even followed guys into prison. So I decided that I just as much want to give you a child, so I have to be willing to take the risk. What about sex? What kind of sex? Sex is what you and I do. These young guys don't know how to use what they have. I don't have any feelings for them at all. Every time I thought about only two things. The first is to get the money we need. And secondly, find the right doctor and a sweetable surrogate mother who will bear our child. Thus, he or she will be our child. He will have all of our genetic material and will be the perfect synthesis of both of us. We need almost half a million dollars, and your work will never give us that kind of money. In 20 years, you can become our son's coach, dear. Isn't that great? Wouldn't all this be worth the few rules we broke? Everything will be as it could be for you. You took a bunch of losers that no one wanted, a bunch of broken toys, and almost made it to the final four. The only reason you didn't make it is because you decided not to make it. I thought the same way about my goal. I almost had the money I needed for our child. So, Gloria, I said slowly, let me clear things up. You cheated on me, broke our marriage vows and had sex with several other men just to get enough money for a child we never talked about. You took something special between us and gave it to other men for something that I'm not even sure I want. Jim, don't look at it like that, she said sadly. You're trying to make it look like it's cheap and nasty. Because it is, I said. Maybe I really made a mistake, she said. I guess I never looked at it from the other side. I never thought about a child. How do we fix this? Maybe it's not worth it, I said. You were always special to me, and I always loved you, Glow. But most of that was because we belonged only to each other. When we first met... You got really angry because I thought you were one of those young girls who hung out with the guys on the team and had sex with them. Most of these girls were very young. You know, they were in that age group of 19 and 20 years old where they really don't understand the value of what they're giving. But you are a 35-year-old woman who supposedly knew that when we first met over 10 years ago, if I wasn't interested in a young, available woman, then why should I be interested in an old one now? But we love each other she said. It shouldn't have ended like this. Call me sometime, Glow. Maybe we can talk about old times, I said. But you did the same to your team, she said. And it blew up in my face, I said. Now I have to start all over again. And this time, I'll be more careful. And you can go into a mindless defense and do the same. You can start over with someone else. You are still a beautiful woman. Jim, come with me, she said. I know I screwed up. I won't do this again. It tears you apart. You still love me, and I love you. Why hurt yourself? Suspicions and regrets, I said. I once read an article where a guy talked about which of these things is easier to live with. Deep down, on some level, you liked having sex with those guys. You couldn't keep doing it this long if it was completely unpleasant, and we both know it. It may not have been your intention, and sex wasn't the reason you did it, but you did it. Someday you'll want to do this again. We're both getting old. Sooner or later, I won't be able to perform at the level you expect, and you might want to try again. Whether it happens or not, this time will always be in my memory. I'll always wonder if you do this. I would follow you around and never fully trust you even if we return the love. On the other hand, if we end this now, you're right, I'll probably regret it. I'll miss you, and you'll be a difficult follower if I'm ever lucky enough to find love again. Is it easier to live with the suspicion that you might hurt me again, or with the regret that I let what we have ended? She looked at me again with her beautiful eyes. I'll choose regret, I said. I left her for the last time just as the agents outside opened the door and told her they had to leave. She signed the divorce papers for me, and the divorce went miraculously quickly. I think the DOJ can work very quickly when their star witness to corruption in college sports needs a divorce to get into the witness protection program. I went home to my old house, but since the press practically lived on my porch waiting for the story, I had to leave. I came here to Crystal Lake to think about what happened and try to decide if I made the right choice. 
The breeze over the lake was calming, but everything was too strange. I always felt like someone was watching me. One morning, while going for a walk, I found a hockey mask on the porch. I decided that regardless of whether my choice was right or wrong, I would now have to live with it. Whatever was driving me, pain, anger, an indignant sense of justice, or just my fragile male ego, it's over, and I must move on. The dean was so angry with the vice principal that he gave me his job, because I served as both athletic director and basketball coach. Even at our small school, I received a huge raise. I could even afford the cost of having Gloria's child. Just the thought of it made me cry. I spent the summer traveling, trying to forget what I had lost. I didn't go on dates or even communicate. I started looking for my next team. It wasn't so difficult anymore. Making the Elite Eight earned me much better recruiting classes. In addition, my reputation as a player who does not tolerate any criticism and is not afraid to bench. Even his stars has earned me a lot of respect. I received several job offers that could have brought me more money, but I stayed in my job. Loyalty meant a lot to me. I really threw myself into my work. I made sure that every player on my team was well-versed in the fundamentals of the game, and all my players were equal. Places in the starting lineup were based on both skill and hard work. There were no more prima donnas on my team. Every evening, I returned home to a lonely, empty house for a battle with a bottle that I knew I would eventually lose. From time to time, they call me on the phone. My caller ID said, number unavailable, and I knew who it was. This is Gloria, and she was just as lonely as I was. Maybe once a month or so, she was allowed to call me, but only so that she could hear my voice. As the months passed, I realized that the pain of what she had done had subsided and I was faced with the reality that I would have to wander around an empty house for the rest of my life. I thought about calling the FBI or someone else and trying to get her back. I was sure that if I talked to her the next time she called and didn't say anything, she could arrange for me to end up in the witness program too. But deep down I knew that I couldn't do that. She betrayed me in the worst possible way and for the stupidest reason. For some reason, I just couldn't take her back. It would probably be better if I ended my life as a decrepit old man whose life consists of nothing but basketball and my Mustang. March Madness was about us all going a little crazy and ending up losing. Most of the players lost their chances at a great life. Gloria lost her marriage and her freedom, and I lost mine too. I was destined to become that lonely, grumpy old man I just mentioned. I'm sure many people would like this story to end this way. Fuck them. It's not like that. Jamal made it through even though he lied. When he approached Jin after the game, he told him that his daughter was pregnant. From the very beginning of this story, I talked about what a good guy Jamal was and how smart he was. He graduated from college and received a diploma. He was also taken by the Charlotte Hornets in the second round of the draft. I helped him find an agent. I hope that someday, when his career is over, he will come back and work with me. Jean insisted that Jamal marry Jennifer because she became pregnant with his child and constantly talked about how much she loved him. Jamal married her without hesitation, and they were happy. It took Jean several months to realize that he had been fooled. Jamal lied. Jennifer was not pregnant. Jamal just knew that Jean would force him to marry his daughter if he thought she was pregnant, which is what he wanted all along. I told you this guy was smart. Jennifer did become pregnant, but only two years later. Less than a year after the whole Gloria thing happened, I was walking into my office. My team finished second in our conference, and although we weren't ready for the tournament yet, I had a good feeling about it. We had to return to the big sport, and soon. Maybe it will happen next year, or maybe the year after. But we were good, and this time I did everything right. I built trusting relationships with these players. And by trusting them, I found freedom. I have gained the ability to open my heart and trust others again. Hey, Jim, Al said. Some woman is waiting for you in your office. I opened the door and saw Molly sitting not at my desk, but in my chair. I tilted my head and looked at her. I had to take classes all year round so I could graduate early, she said. 
I'm now a fully qualified sports psychologist, and that's exactly what you need. What are your salary requirements? I asked. I don't care about all that crap, she said. I know that you will pay me as much as the work might cost, and it doesn't matter because I already have housing and transportation. Well, that's good, I said. I like it when my staff can get to work on time. Okay, stop this talk about sex. Otherwise, I'll have a sexual harassment case, she said. What conversations about sex? I asked. You were talking about your staff, she grinned. And I've been thinking about your staff for a long time, we both laughed. So where are you staying? I asked. You have... We have, she said. So I think I should show you around and introduce you to the rest of the faculty, I said. I have to find you an office. And it should be somewhere near yours, she grinned. Because I really don't like walking. But first, would you like to take care of something? For example, I asked. To say that I completely forgot Gloria and missed you very much. Or say that I would like to try with the USA. I already know all this. I knew you needed time to get over your ex, she said. I gave it to you while I was getting my diploma. I thought that 10 or 11 months would be just right. I also already knew you liked me when I stuck my ass out for you. That doesn't prove anything, I said. But only someone who cares about me would sleep next to me after that and not try to take advantage of me, she said. So what do I need to take care of? I asked. About your promise, she said. Lock the door, Jim. This will probably take some time. Well, what can I say? A promise is a promise. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.